because I think this entire semester is going to be online. The situation is bad and I don't think you are going to be called to the campus in the near future. Most likely even the new admissions will take place online and the first year cadets have not even seen the college. This is the situation we are having and it is not going to get any better in the recent future. So you have to brace yourself for difficulties like this. Only hope that at the time of your seventh semester, something can happen. Your sixth semester will be entirely online, as I see it. It's not going to change. So seventh semester, hopefully, should be at least in the college. And then again, eighth semester will be also in the college because you are not going out to see in the eighth semester. You'll be going in the so-called ninth semester. That means after you get your B.Tech degree, you will be going for your C shipboard training. So you still have entirely more than one year. So I hope by this one year it improves because you have a second wave and then you have a third wave and you have a fourth wave. The same thing is expanding from day to day, every day. So where is the future for our students? Where is the future for the youth? The situation is still very unpredictable. It doesn't mean that after the first wave, everything, after the second wave, that everything will be all right. So I am also very upset, very scared. And uh, be a little careful about not only your physical well-being, also your mental well-being. Now, this has come out to be a new issue that is raging across the Western world. The mental issue of being cooped up inside your house, inside your home, without any chance of mixing with your friends, without mixing with other people. So it does cause certain amount of depression. So being aware of it helps in reducing getting into such a mental condition. So be a little aware that such conditions are happening in the West and possibly it is happening in India too, but it is not given the kind of publicity that the West gives. So be a little aware of this, that you will probably find yourself feeling a little depressed, pooped up, and your actions will follow or based on your depression. So once you're aware of it, there are chances of you being more careful. How much careful? I don't know. So, uh, frankly, I don't know how long to continue with this kind of a situation. We are taking as much precautions as possible, but there are a few, five or six people in the office who have contracted the virus and they have isolated themselves at home and they are not going anywhere. So those who go out of Kolkata will be required to come into quarantine immediately. And I am not getting any response from NYK also. They, have, they seem to have shut down office. I'm trying to ring them up, but there's no response. I will try again. I tried yesterday. There was no response. Again, I'll try today. And uh, I hope it was 33. So 33 cadets have come, and it is already 9.40. So let us start a subject. And uh, somebody tell me where we were in the last class, section C. Because all the class sections, they have got on to different levels on the same subject on the lubrication chapter. Himanish Mukherjee, tell me what page we were in or rather what part of the subject were we dealing with? So Himanish Mukherjee has gone into hibernation. Kundan Kumar, are you there? My goodness, Kundan Kumar is not there. All right, Neha. Where were we on the last subject? Which part of the subject were we talking about? Sir, water contamination of water. blue boil. Okay, 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 thank you. Water contamination of lubricating oil. So I think it was here. Turbocharger contaminations. Yes, contamination of lubricating oil by water. We had discussed what are the sources of water coming into the sump or in the lubricating oil. 
everybody assumes that water from the cylinder or the jacket cooling water leaks into the sump if there is any leakage that does not happen the design of the engine is made in such a way that if the ceiling rings leak or if they get damaged and the water leaks past the ceiling ring they lead into a space from where it is let outside the engine chances of that water coming into the crankcase is very very remote it will not happen oh, somebody is come now mrityunjay das okay he is the last fellow because that's 941 also i'm not allowing any more we have 34 here so what i was saying was if the jacket water leaks it leaks out of the engine it's designed so well so the chances of water coming from the jacket pot cooling is impossible only if the liner cracks if it breaks or if there is a major fracture in the engine then water can come into the tankcase but if the ceiling surfaces leak then there is no possibility of air water going into the tankcase it will leak out of the engine do study the two stroke engine water sealing arrangement through your books through your internet through i wish i could show you some diagrams but the arrangement is such that the water leaks out same thing with the piston cooling water the piston cooling water for a two stroke engine it has to pass through telescopic pipes if you remember the construction of a two stroke piston those telescopic pipes they enter a cavity a cavity means a little bit of a housing and that has a ceiling rings there are two ceiling rings for the two telescopic pipes over a period of time the seals leak because they get worn out so this leakage water is again led out of the engine and there is no possibility of water coming from the piston cooling into the crankcase unless a major rupture or a break or a fracture of the piston takes place which is very 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 rare so the leakage from the piston cooling and jacket cooling is unlikely because the leakage water is led out of the engine okay third part is the lube oil cooler lot of leakages so this lube oil cooler can leak and you see there is sea water entering one side and lube oil entering on the other side now the lube oil pressure is at about 4.6 bar i had told you and the sea water pressure is about 2.5 bar this is your cooler let's take this as an example the sea water is entering from the lower left hand side it passes through the tubes comes up from there and goes out from the upper upper side of the outlet <clears throat> the lubricating oil enters from the bottom passage it goes over baffle plates up and down up and down up and down and this is intended to give maximum exposure to the surface area for the heat transfer so that is why you have these baffle plates the idea is to make the oil circulate completely right over the pipes which are cooled by the sea water and then go out now the pressure this will entire assembly is fitted inside this casing and this casing is actually a cylindrical casing and on either side it has got covers these covers are actually called mud boxes they are called mud boxes why they are called mud boxes i am not sure but they are called mud boxes possibly because they are allowing sea water to come in and in time some amount of mud may accumulate depending on how low or how shallow the water is during the time of running so that is why remember these end covers are sometimes called mud box anyway so this is another cover on this side and in the middle you have what is the tube nest this tube nest can be withdrawn out now these tubes are fitted into the plates if the plates leak the lube oil can go into the sea water and sir what is mayday it is used in emergency time yes jaiswal it is it is something like saying sos save our souls save our souls means it's an emergency call for help same day mayday 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 it means it is calling for help and some disaster is going to take place but where does mayday come in now i am talking about heat exchanger mayday why does it come in now it has got nothing to do right now are you calling mayday because of the covid infection now who's come i am not going to allow this following who is he asib ali 
he's come too early for the next class i have already given the information regarding class tests how, how it will be what it will be etc so just for it is an emergency call for rescue that's all so this tubeness can be withdrawn now if the tubes leak from here the luboil pressure is at 4.6 bar whereas the cooling water is a pressure of 2.5 bar so which is going to leak where the lubricating oil will leak into the cooling water spaces and ultimately that cooling water is going overboard in other words you are invert inadvertently discharging oil out of the out of the ship that means with your cooling water the oil is also going out because there is a leakage in your lube oil cooler this has happened very frequently on many ships especially old ships so it is very essential to identify the leakage and here i am going to give you the knack or the way to identify if your cooler is leaking even without opening the cooler and you cannot see the leakage but you can check if the cooler is leaking and this is something you must do quite often on board the ship if you are on an old ship all right now you see this purging cork on the right hand side right at the top all right now when if there is any leakage if there is any leakage of lube oil into the sea water space now this is the sea water space all right and oil is definitely lighter than water so this little pocket over here right at the tip of that cover will have an accumulation of oil the rest of it will be full of sea water but right on top in this little pocket maybe 3 or 4 cubic centimeters this is a small little pocket over there if it is found with oil that means when you open this purging cork you should get only water or air a little bit of air might come out because this is the topmost region if you get oil from here even a little bit be sure that your cooler is defective and this is the way to identify a defective cooler this little cork is your best indicator for your defective cooler otherwise it's quite difficult other you'll have to open the covers put uh, put back the clamping devices start your lube oil pump and isolate your sea water line and your sea water line isolation is a very tough job because those valves don't close properly so you'll have to put blanks between the flanges which is another messy job so the best way to identify whether your cooler is leaking is to open this purging cork moment to open this purging cork before any water comes some amount of oil will come why because oil floats on top of water and little bit of oil will be locked into this place whereas the sea water will be continuously going but some oil will get locked in if there is any leakage of oil into the sea water line i hope you will remember this because this is not mentioned anywhere else in your in your uh, notes or any book or anything like that so it is only a practical means of identifying a defective luka so in case of leakage lube oil may stick on tube and affect efficiency of heat exchange what is done to prevent it what oil may stick or lube oil will not stick why should it stick it is hot oil it is not very cold the oil is quite hot it will not stick it is not that sticky that will stick on the surface of course there will be a layer of oil on the surface any oil which you put on any steel or metal body it will have it will hold over there it is not going to wash out like water there will be a layer of oil but it does not make any difference really it will not have any effect on the efficiency the oil must be clean it must not be carbonized on the surface then it is okay then it will go smoothly over the surface it will not cause any loss in heat transfer efficiency okay the oil must be clean also that is why if it is dirty oil then the dirt will stick the oil will not stick the dirt will stick on to the surface okay so that was the lube oil cooler if ever you are asked in an oral exam how will you identify a leaking or defective lube oil cooler 
ah how is the expansion arrangement of the end plate is made it is kastavya uh, the good very good question but i thought i was going to skip this cooler part of it because you have been already taught about it in the marine auxiliaries anyway i will tell you what it is you see this tube nest can be with after you open this side of the cover you can remove it remove the cover from this side and then the entire tube nest can be removed from this side the tube nest has got a flange on this side which is sandwiched between the flanges of the cylinder and the end cover okay on the other end it has got a sliding mechanism this sliding mechanism is such that there are two rubber seals here two rubber rings one is this rubber ring and one is this rubber ring of course the, it is not very clearly shown because i thought that you will be learning it in your marine auxiliaries so when the tubes actually expand or contract there will be a differential expansion between the shell and the tube so this is accommodated by allowing the tube nest to expand in other words to slide against the covers that you see other on the other side so there are two rubber rings over here which allow for the sliding of the tubes nest on the surface of the housing so it is an arrangement which will allow expansion and contraction of the tube the tubes are made of generally cupronickel so they have a much higher coefficient of linear expansion as compared to the shell which is usually mild steel with a coating on the inside either casting or mild steel so steel and cupronickel they have a differential coefficient of linear expansion so that is accommodated by allowing one end of the tube to slide inside the casing and at the same time maintaining a sealing between the oil and the water side all right kartavya not clear hello kartavya did it make any yeah. sense to you what is the maximum limit of expansion maybe 2 mm Hey, somebody is getting a scolding. Your mom is scolding you. You have to keep your microphone off. Never mind. Okay. So, uh, what is the maximum limit of expansion? It depends upon the differential coefficient of linear expansion, and the real expansion will be two to three millimeters. It is not going to at the most two to three millimeters is also a lot of expansion. I don't think it's more than one and a half millimeter. Uh, anyway, so the expansion is very little, so it should not make much of a difference. So uh, where were we? Uh, lube oil, lube oil cooler leakages. I have had a very serious problem with this leakage, so I am giving you the best I know. So if at all there is any suspicion about your lube oil cooler, the best way to check whether the Water, uh, the oil is leaking into cooling water side. You check it by opening that purging cock, the cock on the topmost part of your cooler. So, if there is any oil found, you have to take action as quickly as possible. Maybe not instantly if the engine is already running, but as soon as possible, you have to stop the cooler. You have to stop the engine, stop the lube oil pump, stop sea water pump, isolate it, open up the cooler, identify the leaking tubes. and plug them we had to do it within half an hour which was a tough job so what we did we used wooden plugs wooden plugs are excellent sealing once the wood gets soaked in water it expands so once it expands it causes a better sealing and it works excellently but over a period of time the wood rots and then you have to change that plug with a metal plug if you don't have a metal plug immediately use wooden plugs to plug in and the wood once it gets water it expands to seal even better if you don't have normal brass plugs you will have to machine them on the lathe on board the ship manufacture those plugs and then plug it in usually ships have plugs ready made plugs in the store and you will need to identify which plug is for which size and accordingly use them for plugging so there are about 400 
tubes or 500 tubes. So plugging one or two tubes, even five tubes, will not make so much of a difference. Okay. Next is leakages from the sump tank heating coil. Lube oil, in lube oil sump tanks, they have steam heating coils. Right. In very cold climates, these are utilized. But in tropical areas, we don't really need to use them. And because we don't use them, and there is stagnant water inside the tube, they start corroding. And once they corrode, they make a hole. Uh, what is the matter? Oh, that I've answered already. So once they corrode, and then you open the steam, you will be injecting steam into your lube oil tank. So that is why on board ships, I at least would not take any chances with allowing steam going into the tank heating coil. We would blank it. Not only we we close the valve, we also put a blank between the flanges so nobody opens the steam valve even by mistake. So that is one source of water. And the next item is condensation of water vapor inside the crankcase. Water will always be there in the crankcase. The engineer is expected to keep it at the minimum. Minimum means anything between 0 and 0.1%. That is the ideal. The moment it goes to 0.15%, the chief engineer loses sleep. And he will get dark rings under his eyes. He's not slept for three days. Because at 0.15, your engine starts to get damaged. Initial damage. And 0.2 is the limit for water content in your lubricating oil. Be, be very, very careful. And the last one, what you see is centrifugal purifier incorrect operation. This is the most common factor in water contamination. Now, he listen to this very carefully. Lube oil purifier is like the kidney for the engine. All right? It continuously purifies the oil. It removes water, it removes sludge, it removes solid particles also. Now, if the purifier is run appropriately, with the correct size of the gravity disk, which is a very, very, I will say it is a reasonably difficult proposition to get accurately what the gravity disk size will be. Because you first need to check on the nomogram. Write it down on a piece of paper. Nomogram. I could ask you a question in the examination. What is the purpose of a nomogram in the case of a lube oil purifier of a marine diesel engine. Be careful. These are not mentioned in the, I think I should make it a question. What is the purpose of a nomogram? Let me get a pencil first. Yeah. These are points where you need to make questions. And these questions will be not from any book. These will be what I'm giving you. Purpose or nomogram, N-O-M-O-G-R-A-M. -O -O I'll show you a diagram. Nomogram is a chart. And on that chart, you will see that the specific gravity of the oil is given, the temperature variation is given, and on the right side will be the size of the gravity disk. So there are lines which are not horizontal, which are at an angle. Because if you increase the temperature, the specific gravity will change. And based on the change in the specific gravity, you will choose the correct size of the gravity disk. Now, what happens on board the ship? All right, theoretically, you're told you have to run the purifier at 80 degrees centigrade. So you look up the 80 degrees centigrade and the specific gravity of the oil. You coordinate the two marks and you find 122 is the number of the gravity disk that you take. 122 means 122 millimeters is the diameter of that gravity disk. All right. Now, on theory, you have taken it from the chart and it is correct. But in practice, when you actually put it there, the temperature indicated by the thermometer may not be 80. It may be 79, actually. But it is showing 80. Likewise, the specific gravity of the oil, what is given, may not be exactly what it is. But the disk is giving exactly what the numerical values are given. In practice, 
the actual values will differ from the numeric uh, from the theoretical value and that is the time if your disk is not correct water may go into the oil or oil may go into the water little bit little bit of water may go into the oil or oil may go into the water engineers on board are very cautious to see that oil does not go to the water side and go out of the ship so this is the point engineers are very cautious about they will choose a gravity disk with a little margin and stay on the side of safety so in the process what happens no oil will go out in the water but little bit of water will go into the lubricating oil and your expertise will be to get it absolutely as accurate as possible so that neither water goes into oil nor oil goes into water but it is staying on a very narrow margin so engineers prefer to err on the safe side in other words no oil should go with the water are you losing oil so that is why you will find little bit of oil water in the lube oil sump and that is why it is said that lube oil purifier is the main source of water contamination this complaint you will hear mostly but why does it happen it is not really and he is playing safe that is trying to play safe the other source of guaranteed water in it is the water vapor you see if there is a reduction in temperature there will be some amount of concentration or uh, condensation now inside the crankcase the water uh, oil is coming from the main engine and dropping into the crankcase into the sump tank this sump tank is relatively cooler than the engine sump by itself so some amount of condensation takes place and whatever moisture is there in the air will condense as water it is a small quantity but nevertheless it is still water and this water finds its way into the lubricating oil and when the engine is actually running that lubricating oil is not getting a chance for the oil to separate out and come to the bottom so the only way to remove that water is through the purifier so if the purifier is run very accurately very correctly you can remove water but it is unlikely that you will remove 100% of the water so the limitation given to you is 0.2% ideally if you it can be brought to 0.1% it can never be 0% it is impossible practically impossible theoretically you may say it is ideal to bring it but in practice it is not possible to have 0% water in the main engine lubricating oil so the ideal figure is 0.1% let's have a look at it oh i have already told you no yeah 0.2% maximum permitted so causes so the you learned that lubricating oil now what happens if the water goes into the lubricating oil if it exceeds 0.2% then these problems will occur number one is acid formation in lubricating oil for trunk type piston engines reduction in the cooling capacity uh, cooling efficiency reduction in load carrying capacity of the lubricating oil because the film of oil will have water inside and water being of a different viscosity the extent or the thickness of the film will be much less so there will be more chances of having boundary lubrication which means where there is water there is possibility of the metal to metal contact taking place so if the film of oil is not formed there would be metal to metal contact and the reason for it not forming is water in the lubricating oil so it is very essential to have that lubricating oil film between the two surfaces and one of the key parameters for having that film is the viscosity of the oil now if you introduce water into it the viscosity is going to change so you will have molecules of oil molecules of water which will depress and have metal to metal contact so that is why you say reduction in load carrying capacity of the lubricating oil okay next is reduction in lube oil properties such as bn bn is base number base number is indicative of the alkalinity of the oil all right so what happens alkalinity it is soluble in other words if there is water in it the water will wash out that water will combine with that alkali 
and alkali solution will come out of the oil so ultimately your lubricating oil which is supposed to be alkaline of a certain strength will become much less next thing that will happen with water is formation of sludge sludge can also form with water it initially starts out as an emulsion and thereafter it becomes a uh, sludge water can also cause corrosion in various parts of the machinery that i think does not require any extended explanation anywhere there is water and the oxygen there will be oxide formation so metal parts which are exposed to atmosphere and they are getting washed with water the oil is getting moved out because of the water so there is exposure to the oxygen in the atmosphere and water is made helping it out so ultimately you have corrosion in various parts of the machinery and the last one is what you see is microbial degradation of lubricating oil microbial degradation can happen only if there is water in the oil that i all thing already explained to you only when there is water in the oil and it is stagnant over a period of time you will have microbial degradation of the oil and that means the bacteria will consume the hydrocarbon of the oil and make sludge so ultimately you are left with a mass of sludge and the oil has become damaged it has in fact become slimy slimy is you know sticky and nothing like oil that it should be horrible and it's got a horrible smell also and the smell is actually of rotten eggs rotten eggs is again essentially hydrogen sulfide okay any more questions oh there is one question on the first point and the fourth point contradicting each other okay let's have a look first point is acid formation and reduction in lube oil why contradicting in fact this will help they are in fact they are correlating sir sir i meant sir i meant to say that in the first point it said that acid formation took place in lube oil for trunk type engines then okay. in the fourth point it says that the same lube oil helps in reduction of base number so obviously, how obviously so that is what if the base number gets reduced to zero let us say because there is acid isn't it now that acid is stronger than the base number that is there so there will be further corrosion the base yes. al alkali is there it will reduce the acid to a certain extent beyond that the acid will continue corroding the surfaces yes sir see they are complementing each other not contradicting each other if you go in depth on the subject you will find much more happens this is only just point wise given to you but you can understand how they are correlated see there is acid coming in and there is water in it okay now that acid is going to reduce the alkalinity the alkalinity is going to disappear altogether so whatever acid is left over will further cor corrode the surface so that is the reduction in the lube oil properties such as base number the alkalinity will be lost because of that water water and acid on the solution which is going to negate whatever alkalinity is there get the point hello paran yes sir okay let's move on not contradicting but in fact correlating to each other okay how to deal with sea water contamination in lube oil you see sea water is one of the worst thing that can happen to the lubricating oil in fact it can be the worst thing happening to the fuel oil also because you are surrounded with sea water and it is got a ability to get anywhere you want to and not get into anywhere where you want to if you want to fill up a ballast tank you will find you are struggling to fill up that ballast tank and if you don't want it to get into another coffer dam or another side tank you find is getting into it so this is one difficulty on board the ship you have to be as marine engineers excellent pipeline engineers and pump experts you must know pumps and pipelines very thoroughly this is one part of your learning on board the ship as a junior engineer as a senior engineer you will become a pro but in the junior levels how to pump out from one tank to another and identify why it is not pumping 
and also be able to understand why a pump is not drawing how to check whether it is providing the required vacuum to cause the suction where it is possibly leaking how to find the leakages how to find places where the air is coming into the system these are your expertise that you will have to master as a junior engineer so same with pumping oil pumping lubricating oil pumping diesel oil pumping ballast water pumping fresh water you have to be a very good pipeline engineer and a pump your knowledge on pumps should be professional very good at uh, without any doubts if you understand pumps you will understand why pumps are not working or they are working below par anyway so let's go back to how to deal with sea water contamination in lubricating oil first thing is to find and rectify the source of sea water and fresh water leakages immediately i have already shown you the sources of leakage jacket cooling water unlikely piston cooling water unlikely sea water cooler yes and how to identify open that purging cock to check moment you get oil there you are confirmed with sea water okay i have a question for you farhan that reminds me and the question i ask almost every year for the last 20 years while i've been teaching if if you found a sample of water in your lube oil sump and you have managed to get it to some cork or somewhere how will you know it is fresh water or sea water they look the same farhan yes sir amdur how will you tell if it is sea water or fresh water you don't need to be a rocket scientist for this farhan ye ma chi 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 you cannot answer this question you got a long way to become a marine engineer who can give me an answer somebody so by testing the density you make a very impractical marine engineer very very impact you better become mechanical engineer don't be marine engineer somebody so, sir if uh, sea water will dry then it will leave trace of some white like uh, white traces there will be no traces no white traces nothing it is as clear and perfect as fresh water distilled water out at sea the sea water is as clear as distilled water sir after no drying after drying so yes, you going sir, to wait you are going to wait for a glass of water to dry up and then no, decide that it is sea water we will spill it on some cloth and if it will uh, <laughs> dry it will leave some white trace no, no you still don't make a good quality marine engineer somebody come on neha neha sarthi will tell us come on neha give it a shot neha are you paying attention what is your tongue for can your tongue distinguish between salt water and fresh water yes sir ah uh, all you need to dip your finger and put one drop on your tongue and you will know if it is salt water or fresh water and believe me you will not die you will not die with one drop of sea water coming in your mouth other lot of people who are taking sea side holidays they would have been dead because they are solely not of sea water but sea water is horrible it is a it is not like the same taste as you mix a spoon of table salt in a glass of water and you taste it it is nothing like that it is nothing like that it is got a, a completely a different salt taste that salt taste has got a stinging taste very sharp very sharp you can't take even one teaspoon into your mouth it's so bad okay farhan aren't we aren't the person oh this i have already answered so the best way to identify salt water and sea water is to taste it with your tongue and you tell him instantly you don't need laboratory you don't need a cloth you don't need a glass you don't need to dry it you don't look for white traces nothing be practical you have to have very good practical ability within you that is why marine engineers are much much more practical than the other lines of engineering you have to on the spot you have to decide and by what you see you will have to diagnose what is the fault 
and after diagnosing the fault you have to immediately take action it is not like you report the fault to somebody and then when he tells you what is the report make an inquiry then you make an inquiry and find out what is wrong nothing of that type you see the fault you decide what has caused the fault you remove the cause and repair or to take action that should be the attitude for a marine engineer on the spot decisions and on the spot actions if required it is like that so you have to build that attitude within you okay so where was i yeah find and rectify source of sea water and fresh water leakage is immediately if it is fresh water it could be your lube oil purifier it could be your condensation it could be your piston cooling it could be your jacket cooling you have to eliminate most of it and mostly it is fresh water not sea water sea water will come if there is a defect in the lube oil cooler and uh, and i did not i think i have not explained to you how does the sea water come into the lube oil because the lube oil pressure is 4.5 bar or uh, sorry 5 bar 5 kg per cm square whereas the sea water pressure is 2.5 so how does the sea water come into the uh, lubricating side kartavya have you understood the question yes sir ah so how does the sea water come into the lube oil the pressure of lube oil is more there is every chance of lube oil going overboard no answer sir thinking that go ahead give it a shot doesn't matter if you are wrong it's a learning experience yes see the lube oil oh, sorry the sea water comes into the lube oil side when you are sleeping actually sleeping why that is the time your engine is off shut down your lube oil pump is off your main sea water sir, pump condensation is off. sir huh the condensation of air no that is fresh water i am asking you how does sea water come into the lube oil pump okay this is a very good question for your class test also i will put it but not to your section because now you will know uh, sea water into some how okay i'll tell you how see when you are in port everything is relaxed you switch off the engine i mean you shut down the engine switch off the lube oil pump moment you switch off the lube oil pump what is the pressure zero all right oil all go drains into the sump tank now you switch off the main sea water pump but you have to keep the harbor sea water pump on because your auxiliary engines are running so that auxiliary engine which is being cooled by fresh water has to be cooled by sea water so the sea water pump is running for the auxiliary engine but all sea water pipelines inside the engine room are interconnected okay you may switch off the main sea water pump but the harbor sea water pump is running you may close the valve also no problem you isolate the valve from the main engine side all right let us say that but what happens you see the whole ship is in water and outside the engine room there is a head of water that means you are where you are standing inside the engine room you are standing below the level of water which is outside the ship okay now that head pressure will come in through the pipelines and all the sea water pipelines will be under pressure even if all the pumps are off at all times sea water pipelines are under pressure how much pressure about 1.5 to 2 bar that will be the pressure when you are running the pump about 3 bar at the most 2.5 to 3 see main sea water pump does not create pressure it creates volume flow sea water pump creates volume flow of water so that is how water is passed through sea water it is not a high pressure pump but it is a large volume flow so this head pressure will be there in all the pipelines now if a lube oil cooler is leaking lube oil uh, sea water side pressure will be 1.5 bar and your lube oil side pressure will be zero so which one will go into which side the sea water will slowly keep seeping into the lube oil side 
and then it will go draining right into your sump and your sump level will gradually keep increasing so next day when you come down to the engine room before you start your uh, lube oil purifier you will check how much oil is in the sump and when you shut down the engines at the end of all you are expected to take all the soundings and log it down in the log book so that time you had logged down 50 cm of lube oil in the sump tank next morning you come and you again check what is the sump level and you find it 75 cm so you wonder where has this oil come from god has been very kind or what so you lower a tape and you check that tape again see if any water there is no water because the tape has to go through the oil then it goes through the water and reaches the bottom and then again when you withdraw the tape it comes out of the water and into the oil again so when the tape actually comes out into your hands the entire tape is coated with only oil it does not show any water so you assume that the entire tank is full of oil and then if you start your pump what is going to happen it is going to draw that oil and water and make it into an emulsion pass it through the engine and you are finished the engine will also get damaged your lubricating oil will also get damaged so it is a very nasty problem to have have on board the ship so what we do initially is start the lube oil purifier without fail you start the lube oil purifier and keep a watch to see what is coming out of the purifier because there are those covers with which you can see whether oil is coming out or water is coming out and initially there will be a gush of water coming because water settles right to the bottom if you remember the diagram i gave you the suction pipe of the lube oil purifier is right at the bottom lowest and that is where the water accumulates so the first thing that the purifier will draw is the water and remove the water so after some time when you see the water has stopped and only the oil is coming into the purifier you can be assured that now the water has gone so you check the sounding again and then you will find again it is 50 cm back to original so this is the precaution you must take care before starting your main engine any time let the purifier run 2 3 hours if it has to and the oil in, in that process will become warmer so when you start your lube oil pump it will be the oil hot oil or warm oil that will be circulating through your engine and keeping your engine in readiness okay so this is the way you deal with sea water contamination from your sea water cooler and that is the only source where your sea water can come in and the action you will take if you find that it is a mixture of oil and dirt and debris then you transfer the whole some oil to the lube oil dirty oil tank that is an overhead tank shown in the diagram or the settling tank maintain temperature around 60 to 75 i will say 75 degrees centigrade uh, remove the 60 60 is a little low 75 degrees celsius in the tank now when it is settling in that dirty oil tank the water and oil will slightly separate out all right once it separates out the water will reach to the bottom and that is the time you open the drain to check if the water is coming out and that's how you remove most of the water after most of the water is removed when the little oil starts coming then you run your purifier from the tank to the tank from the tank to the tank it is a continuous process of cleaning the oil so that is how you remove the dirt and water from that settling tank which is steady because your steam opening to the sump tank is closed the steam opening to the dirty oil tank is possible that's the way it is so once the oil is stored in the sump and uh, that dirty oil tank your sump will be empty so that is the time you need to open up the manhole covers and use a blower for blowing air into the tank for good 1 hour 2 hours after you're sure that the whole tank has been blown out of any gas that might be there then only you can send people inside to clean with the rags so with rags the entire sump tank has to be cleaned this is very rare it is not done very frequently very rare only when the oil is contaminated very severely so then after it is cleaned the chief engineer or second engineer will have to go inside the tank and then check whether it has been cleaned properly 
and whether anything has been left behind. So these are the two main issues. So once that is done, you can bring that oil in the dirty oil tank and take a sample and send it to the laboratory for testing. And they will indicate to you whether that oil can be reused or it needs a little supplementing with fresh oil. And then you can bring that oil back into the sump tank and add a little more of fresh oil and bring it up to usable level. All right. So run the blue oil in batch purification, batch operation at about 78 degrees. So in case of leakage, oil goes out with seawater. Okay. My goodness. My, uh, are you asking me this question or telling me this situation? The chief so engineer, call... chief engineer and captain, for them it is called Kalabus. They will be arrested. It is nothing, not just violation of Marpol. They will be arrested by the harbor authorities on bringing the ship ashore. It is very, very serious. In fact, I nearly got arrested in 19... Uh, I think in 1989-90, it was in Valparaiso and they were drop by drop oil going out from the discharge pipe of one of the discharge lines. And one drop of oil came out and it came to the surface and that drop of oil was still the drop of oil, but there was a sheen. I hope you understand the meaning of sheen, S-H-E-E-N. It is a sort of a shining surface. If you see with the light, you see multicolor on the surface of the water. So this one one drop of oil was coming out after about three, four minutes. About, about three or four minutes, one drop come out. And that drop of oil was noticed by the Coast Guard who were moving around in the port. You see, it is not like our port. They have their policemen on the water moving around the ships to check who is discharging what whether any unsocial activity is taking place where, what do you call, um, what is that term used? Uh, piracy, pirating or anything. So they are very careful. So they see a drop of oil and they found another drop of oil about 20 meters from there and they kept following five, six drops and came to our ship. And as soon as they boarded the ship, they came to the chief engineer's cabin and told the chief, you're pumping out oil. It was an accusation like as if drums of oil was being thrown out on board, out of the ship. It was, and they were all in their post guard uniform, military. So they came, they said, you're pumping out oil. I said, what pumping out? We're not pumping out oil. In the meantime, our junior engineers got wind of it. So they quickly went to the engine room and one of those oil valves, for discharge overboard called sludge tank discharge. They tapped on the spindle to ensure that the valve was closed. So the spindle went and further closed the valve from which was suspected. So then I, I was in my cabin. So from my cabin, we went down on the deck. From the deck, they lowered the gangway and they had already their patrol boats along the ship side, other side of the quay. So when I went on their patrol boat, and I asked them, where is the oil? They said, Chief, you wait and you look here. So I was looking there and we kept looking and we kept looking, but there was no oil. So they were a little fox that when the chief engineer comes to see, none of the oil comes out. Yet when the chief engineer was not there, the oil was coming. So that was the situation. So for a good one hour, I kept waiting over there to see one drop of oil coming out. But nothing came out. And so they had to go back with small faces. But I had realized that it is coming out from our ship only. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come. They wouldn't have. It was surely from our ship. So then, we, as an argument, I told them, I think you are making a mistake. It is not from our ship. It must be coming from other ship. Please go and check the other ships. So they did not say anything. But they went off because the oil had stopped. So this is the situation in 1989. For one drop of oil, I could have been arrested. Now, if they smell oil, they will arrest you. It will become so serious. So uh, forget about Marpol regulation. Even one drop of oil will send you behind bars. So, but in case of this uh, leakage in uh, heat exchanger, 
the hmm. sea water is not purified i am asking about that sir okay uh, i will tell you about the of the lube oil cooler also you see lot of countries especially the developed countries france uk germany italy greece turkey all these places are very advanced they have their satellites on top right on top of the earth and those satellites are continuously monitoring the surface areas near your coastline and they can detect oil surface from that distance and immediately information can be passed to the harbor harbor master or port state control so even at 2 o'clock night when captain is sleeping chief engineer is sleeping and the junior engineer is very comfortable in the control room with all pressure satisfactory no leaks indicated he will get a call saying the chief there is a trace of oil along your entire ship and we have detected that trace of oil from your ship no other ship how did they detect it two satellites and they can trace that sheen of oil coming out and they will follow that sheen to come to that particular ship and they will inform the harbor that at this certain longitude and latitude there is a particular ship which has got a trace of oil behind it so then you are caught so you will be asked to come to the harbor port state control office master and chief engineer and then be told so then the chief engineer falls from the sky saying i have not pumped out any oil junior engineers have not done any pumping then later with a lot of inquiry investigation they found your lube oil cooler is leaking or the other source can be your stern tube oil seal has been damaged if your stern tube oil seal is damaged then again your oil will be leaking out from there so these are the two sources where your lube oil or lube oil both are lube oil that can be going overboard this is very very serious in today's world in the years ago it wasn't so serious but now it has become very serious and the only action can be arrest arresting even for not discharging oil you can be arrested if they find what is called the magic pipe the magic pipe you study on your own find out what is the magic pipe on board ships put it down on google and you will tell you the whole story it is a malpractice on board the ship which is used to remove sludge from the sludge tank and have it discharged through the oily water separator the pipelines have to be disconnected and put so if the port state control comes and sees that your pipe has been disconnected from your oily water separator they will arrest you there are traces that the nut and bolt has been recently opened that is enough for you to be arrested under suspicion that you are using a bypass line to pump out the oil that is very serious it has happened on ships and there are a lot of stories on these and sure enough the penalty is very very severe you get my point kartik yes sir ah, yes is better to have that fear in you now not later after the consequence okay so where were we clean the sump etc run lube oil purifier send purified lube oil sample for shore analysis shore analysis will report will specify whether the lube oil can be used or treatment such as water washing to be carried out or not return oil to sump after satisfactory report else renew the oil now water washing what is water washing of oil okay now sometimes what happens we mostly do it with fuel oil what happens sea water contamination of fuel oil is not uncommon it gets contaminated with sea water and then how do we remove the sea water we first put heating into the settling tanks and that heat helps the water to evaporate most of it because the temperature is around 60 to 70 degree centigrade officially you are permitted up to 60 but on board the ship we sometimes let it go up to 70 the water from the sea water evaporates but what happens to the salts the magnesium chloride the sodium chloride and possibly calcium carbonate whatever salts are there the most common is sodium chloride and magnesium chloride these are the two now these salts remain with the oil 
but the water has gone the h2o part of it is gone the mgcl2 and nacl is remaining so how do we get rid of it because it is going to affect your combustion process very severely so when the fuel oil comes into the purifier we open a little bit of fresh water in the trickle so that fresh water goes and mixes with the uh, fuel oil partly and actually absorbs or dissolves the salt in that fresh water and then when that fresh water is separated in the purifier that salt with the fresh water comes out as water and the oil gets washed out of its salt and comes out on the other side this is the practice we used to do on board the ship and this is the one way of removing the salt which has come through from sea water which has dr partially dried up and if there is any more of the sea water it helps to be removed altogether so this is what is called water washing same thing with lubricating oil but it is very rare with lubricating oil to get sea water into it is similar situation where you, i told you when the engine is stopped everything is stopped and then you run your lube oil purifier and if some amount of sea water remains there possibly because of the warm some of it is evaporated so the salt will remain with the lube oil and the way to remove that salt from the lube oil is to allow a little fresh clean water into the lube oil while separating before it goes to the purifier so when it goes into the purifier part of that water dissolves the salts that is there and comes out on the water side because there it will be a separating ring between the water in the periphery and the oil in the center under centrifugal force the water has a higher uh, specific gravity so it goes to the periphery whereas the oil being of a lower specific gravity will come to the center and from the center the oil is taken out because as more of it comes out it helps to pump out it is like a centrifugal pump inside but that pump is not rotating it is the housing that is rotating that is how a purifier works and builds pressure enough to send that oil to the settling tank okay so that is that next is allowable limits for water in lube oil for crosshead type of engines water in lube oil to be less than 0.2% you should be a capital letter yeah take immediate action when the water content is between 0.15 and 0.2% i would say take action immediate action when the water content is between 1 and 0.2% let's be a little more strict about this 0.1% and 0.2% immediate at 0.15% chief engineer has lost his sleep it is so serious you think 0.2% is a small quantity no it can damage your engines so the water has to be out from that lubricating oil it can be very very consequential okay water content above this may not above this may damage it will damage it is not may damage it will damage this will damage let's put it will will be a little more longer words be used it will damage the engine yes not may damage it will damage for trunk type of engines water in the lube oil is to be less than 0.15% take immediate action when the water content is above 0.1% water content above this may damage the again may uh, above this will damage it's very polite language but it should be a little stern language this will damage the engine once you get attuned to these figures and these conditions your attitude towards the engine will change you will be more caring more careful more on the alert for any situation like this okay fuel dilution fuel dilution means when the fuel goes into the lubricating oil when unburned diesel fuel makes its way past the rings into the engine oil in the crankcase fuel contamination of fuel dilution results fuel dilution can decrease oil viscosity and lubricity even at very low quantities increasing both wear and potential for bearing failure and the potential for bearing failure now see what he says up here 
when unburned fuel comes out to the piston and goes out that is very rare unless the nozzle has broken off that kind of oil will not come into there it can be leaking tool injector which means a trickle of oil is coming so maybe on a very rare instance the oil will come over the piston it will not fire so much of oil is there it will come past the piston rings and into the crankcase or a four stroke engine this is one way but this is not very common i have had four to five instances of fuel dilution for auxiliary engines we have never had in last so many years fuel dilution in the main engine but it is possible it can happen but more commonly it happens in auxiliary engines and for sure during your uh, professional life on board ships at one time or the other you will also face a similar situation especially if the ship is a little old and the maintenance has not been so perfect now where does it leak from the most common leakage that i have found from experience is the fuel injector pipe which leads to the injector now this pipe is a very high pressure pipe over a period of time it becomes work hardened initially it is ductile when it is new it is ductile but over a period of time it becomes work hardened that means the whole pipe it becomes stiffer after a certain use work hardening you write down on a piece of paper what is work hardening and you go and study find out what it is otherwise i waste a lot of time in explaining so this pipe becomes very brittle because it has become work hardened and that portion where the nut holds the fuel injector onto the cylinder head is repeatedly opened and closed opened and closed why every time you open it you are required to take out the injector and pressure test it to see if it is satisfactory then again you put it and tighten the nut each time you tighten the nut the end of the pipe is very considerably stressed under a lot of load so each time you put it on load and take it again again put it on load again take it out so it becomes very brittle so that is the point at the neck of that pipe that fracture takes place this fracture is a hairline fracture and it cannot be seen it only allows the oil to leak out when the pump is building pressure for injecting the oil into the injector so that is the time the gap opens allows the oil to come out and again close so it is such a fine hairline fracture so you you can only find out when the engine is running if the engine is stopped we cannot find out you cannot look at all the pipes find out so when uh, an indication is there that there is fuel contamination and that arises when the pressure drops suddenly if the pressure drops immediately you know there is fuel dilution because the viscosity of the lubricating oil drops so the pump pressure will also drop all right so moment that happens you are expected to remove all the covers and go and check one indication is the smell when you remove the cover you are supposed to get only lubricating oil smell but if you start getting diesel oil smell you know this is quite sure to be the one but you require further proof by putting a finger or a cloth in the injector pipe nozzle while it is working and to see if any diesel oil comes there moment it comes there you know this particular unit but you need to check all the units okay now if you put 1 liter of diesel oil in 300 liters of lube oil the change will be drastic the fuel will become very thin uh, sorry the lube oil will become very thin none of the viscosity is lost and the pressure will drop all right so this is the most common the second part oh here it is in four stroke engine the fracture of the fuel pipe to the injector is a common source of dilution because that is the point where the oil leaks and the rocker arms are also there which are lubricated by lubricating oil so the lube oil and the diesel oil mix there and come into the crankcase so it is the most common place for the four stroke engines what is the solution periodically renew the pipes which come from the fuel pump to the injector costly but it has to be done those pipes are very costly the second place where the fuel oil pumps can cause leakage is you see the plunger and barrel if you remember the bosch fuel pump the plunger and barrel over time may be get worn out 
especially if there are catalytic fines. So when the oil starts leaking down, and there is possibility of the oil leaking past the sealing ring, the the what you call the roller assembly and into the camshaft. So once it goes into the camshaft spaces, it will mix with the lubricating oil because the camshaft is lubricated with lube oil. So what is the solution where pump leakage can cause the oil to go into the camshaft spaces? Okay, now here it is. You have an arrangement on the plunger like an umbrella. You know what is an umbrella? So this umbrella is clamped on to the plunger at the bottom. So any oil leaking from the barrel and the plunger falls on the umbrella and goes to a little to the side where there is a tray which collects the oil and leads it out of the engine. So here is the diagram of the uh, umbrella seal of the fuel pump. Okay. Karthik, can you see the diagram now? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, this is your plunger, bottom part of the plunger that you see. Okay. Now, here, instead of having it directly to the rock, uh, the roller, and all, they have a long extended part of the cam follower. And on the plunger at the bottom, they have put one seal. This is called the umbrella seal. So that any oil leaking from the top will fall on this seal and come into this space here. And as it comes into this space, it is led out from this drain passage and out. The whole pump housing is resting on a shelf. This shelf is the wall of the camshaft spaces. The, uh, this space where you see the cam follower written, this is the camshaft space. And this spigot that you see over here, spigot is the protrusion at the bottom of the housing. It rests in a recess on the shelf which is there. So the whole pump is fixed onto that shelf and the shelf uh, separates the pump space and the camshaft space. And also this space over here has a sealing arrangement here so that no oil from the camshaft will go up into this space and come into this space here. So you have a separate O-ring over here you can see. It prevents any lubricating oil which is coming onto the cam roller to go up into that space and come out from here. But and the fuel oil which may leak from the barrel is allowed to fall on this umbrella. It doesn't come into this space here. If it comes into this space, then it will leak past and come into the camshaft space. So the idea is to avoid that oil which is leaking from the barrel and plunger to come into the space, into the camshaft spaces. So you have this umbrella fitted onto the foot of the plunger and then that oil comes into this space. From there you see this drain passage allows that oil to be drained into a separate space. From there it is removed out of the engine. So this is what is an umbrella seal in a fuel pump. Okay. Okay, so leaking fuel pumps can cause fuel ingress into the camshaft space and hence to the lube oil system. So to prevent it, you have an umbrella seal. I have not mentioned it here because it's not required in your syllabus also. But for your general knowledge, remember two sources of leakage of fuel pump, fuel oil, is one is from that fuel injector pipe and the second one is from the bottom of the fuel pump. But engines have designed umbrella seals which prevent such things to happen. Now, if there is a flood, if there is a complete pouring out, then you cannot stop it. Then it will fill up the spaces. Now, before the drain can come out, the space gets filled up and it will go into the camshaft space. But that is very, very rare. But it is not impossible. Sometimes the impossible happens on ships. Okay. Detection. Even a moderate decrease in oil viscosity can indicate the presence of fuel contamination. As testing for fuel dilution is the measurement of one petroleum product within another, it is most accurately identified by gas chromatography, a process that separates the mixture 
by vaporizing the sample and measuring each component release. Now, this is the process by which the laboratories do it. You on board are not required to do it. I have included it so that you are aware that what is the laboratory doing to identify fuel contamination with lube oil. So it is a laboratory process where they use gas chromatography. That's enough. Gas chromatography to identify fuel oil contamination with lube oil. On board the ship, unusual drop in the lube oil pressure is indicative. That means suppose you're coming every day and seeing that the pressure is 3.5 bar for your number two generator, lube oil pressure. Suddenly during after one hour of watching, you find it has come down to 3.2, but the temperatures are the same. Immediately, it is a reason to suspect that fuel oil has gone in. Inevitable. So that is the time you suspect. So even without going to check the oil, by looking at the pressure gauge, you should be able to tell that there is fuel oil contamination. Of course, this is only in the case of generators. It is not in the case of your main engine because the fuel oil used for main engine is usually very thick heavy oil. And that heavy oil specific gravity is close to lubricating oil. So there will be no change in viscosity in the case of heavy oil mixing with lubricating oil. But there will be definitely a change in the flash point. And flash point is another test that is made out in the laboratory to identify if there is any fuel oil contamination. OK, the third thing that is usual to identify fuel oil contamination is the smell. If you take a sample of that contaminated oil and smell it, and you take a uh, uh, the original lubricating oil and smell it, there will be a very distinctive smell. The fuel diesel oil is much more distinctively smelt in the case of the lube oil. So that is one way, and it will take a little time, little practice on board. In fact, on board, after about a year or so of being familiar with your engine room, while sitting in the control room, you will be able to tell whether there is diesel oil leaking somewhere or lube oil leaking somewhere or fuel oil leaking somewhere. Your sense of smell will improve in this area and you will be able to identify that somewhere some oil is leaking because this smell is not normal. So you can also identify what is leaking, diesel oil, lube oil, fuel oil, what? Because all three have a very distinctive smell. It has happened on ships. And the moment you take your round inside the engine room, it is not only eyes and ears that are in action. It is also your smell, sense of smell. Sometimes you can identify an overheating component with your sense of smell. The sense of smell means something is burning. Little burning smell is there. And sure enough, it is not really burning. It is overheating. And that smell will also be distinctive. So when you're on watch inside the engine room, it is not only your sight and sense of hearing that is alert with machinery that is moving around, also your sense of smell. You can smell overheated machinery also. It is like that. They give out a distinctive smell of overheating. OK. Sample lube oil can be checked through smell. OK. Change in flash point is indicative and requires oil change if it below if it is below 180 degrees Celsius. Your lube oil flash point is 205 degrees centigrade. Now, usually 205, maybe plus or minus 5 degrees. So if the flash point drops, say 195, it can still be used. You add a little fresh lube oil into it and raise the flash point to 200. So it can be used. But once it reaches below 180 degrees centigrade, you cannot use that lubricating oil again because it may give rise to a possible easier condition for a crankcase explosion. Okay. So flash point will definitely, that will be the most distinctive difference between normal lube oil and contaminated lube oil. In the case of your diesel oil contamination, then the viscosity will change, thereby the pump pressure will change. So you will know immediately. 
in the case of your main engine, there will be no change in the viscosity, no change in the pump pressure. Be more or less the same. So you need to have this expertise on board the ship to identify faults when they occur with your lubricating oil. Risk. Fuel contamination is a serious issue that makes early detection vital to maintaining machinery health or component health. As diesel fuel lowers oil viscosity, it reduces the corrosion protection of lube oil and also the additives and accelerates component wear. This is a repetition of what has been told earlier. It destroys the lubricating oil. Film formation is severely hampered. That is also true. So your, lube, your contaminated lube oil no longer functions like a lubricating oil. And you remember the seven functions that the lube oil was supposed to do. So those functions will go down the hill. Film formation is severely hampered. Extremely severe cases can result in a crankcase explosion as flashpoint will have reduced. So there is a chance of a much easier crankcase explosion if the flash point of the lubricating oil is reduced. Cylinder oil. Now cylinder oil is also a contaminant. So what is the cause? The cause is leakages past the stuffing box, which is also the piston rod gland. This will result in the partly burnt carbonized cylinder oil sludge from the under piston spaces to enter the crankcase spaces and contaminate the system oil. You see, you, it is not just pouring slowly. It is being forced into the crankcase spaces. Why? Because the under piston space is under pressure. It is the second stage of scavenge air pressurizing. What comes from the turbocharger comes into one section of the scavenge manifold. From that section, it comes through scavenge valves, non-return scavenge valves, to the under piston spaces when the piston goes up. And it fills up the space below the piston. Now, when the piston comes down, it compresses that air. And that air through a separate set of crankcase uh, scavenge valves will go past and go into the cylinder. That is the time the piston comes down, so it has to go into the cylinder. Then again, when it goes up, the air coming from the turbocharger will come in there. And then when the piston comes down, again, this air will be pushed out to the separate scavenge valve into the cylinder. So this under piston space is always under pressure when the engine is running at full speed or full load. So the oil which is splashing on the piston rod will be forced down to the piston rod stuffing box into the crankcase. So it is not just leaking. It is almost being forced in. So your piston rod stuffing block has to be in very good condition to avoid contamination of a main engine global sump. I'm getting tired. Okay. All right. I hope you have understood that. The mixing of cylinder oil and system oil changes the viscosity as well as the base number value to upset the normal requirements in bearing lubrication and damage results. I told you viscosity is the key requirement for your lubricating oil to function satisfactorily. Now, if that changes, everything will get damaged because cylinder oil has a different viscosity and the alkalinity is also different. So it will change the quality of your system oil and damage will result. Okay. So that is what cylinder oil does. It will change the viscosity, it will change the alkalinity, and it will have sludge in it, unburnt, oxidized carbon, little bits of particles of piston ring and cylinder liner, metal particles. Then it will have catalytic fines. It will have oxidized oil and carbon. A lot of muck. Cylinder oil under piston spaces is one of the filthiest parts of the engine. And it takes enormous effort to clean that part. Filthiest. And it is sticky. It is black. It is easy to get on yourself. Very difficult to get it off. It is like that. Yeah. Next is carbonaceous products of combustion. Now this is what is blow past from the combustion spaces. Again, into the under piston spaces. From there, it comes into again air stream. So these are the products which come from combustion. That is combustion debris, ash, 
oxides of vanadium you see oil contains vanadium so when vanadium oxidizes it forms oxide various number of them so vanadium pentoxide is one of the products and that acts as a catalyst salts of calcium where does the salt of calcium come you see the cylinder oil alkali is sometimes calcium carbonate this calcium carbonate sometimes if it is not utilized will come down with the cylinder oil in the oil okay unburnt fuel if the combustion process is not satisfactory if your atomization and penetration is not satisfactory you will get unburnt fuel into the space carbon is any time you burn fuel you are likely to get carbon generally arise through leakages past the stuffing box when the piston rings are worn and blow past takes place i think it's quite easy to understand this insoluble these are called abrasives insoluble means we do not dissolve with the oil so of these six contaminants abrasives are far by far by far the most damaging to lubricating oil lubricating damaging to lubrication systems and engine components common abrasives in the form of dust and dirt can enter the lubrication system through leaks in the air intake system that means your turbocharger filters air intake system any ceiling that is there ventilating system or even a contaminated supply of new oil so anywhere it can come from there insoluble abrasives and in fact there are there in uh, lubricating oil in new supply of new lubricating oil l u b lube oil okay as they circulate within the oil they cause wear to metal components which can produce additional wear particles that may arise that may cause even greater damage you see now this situation has become a chain reaction what happens is metal components they get they come into being if there is abrasive between two surfaces now suppose if you have sand between two surfaces and you allow the two surfaces to rub with each other then the sand will score the base surface and dig up some more metal and that metal will again be another abrasive and that abrasive is even harder than the base metal why again work hardening happens so when the metal is scraped up the powder it is again rubbing between the two surfaces and this rubbing between them causes work hardening of those metal particles that means they become harder than the base metal and again when they are rubbed in they dig out more metal so it's a chain reaction so the damage keeps moving on and on and on if you do not keep the oil clean it is very crucial to remove all abrasives from the lubricating oil that is why we have what is called deterrent detergency and dispersancy properties built into the lubricating oil they will wash this powder that is there keep it in suspension and take it to the cleaning devices to the purifier and to the filter and remove as much debris or abrasive material that is there so the property of the oil must have this special ability to clean the place and whatever it has cleaned carry it together with the oil and take it to the filter and the purifier so detergency and dispersancy are the two properties which help in this process okay let's move on detection of abrasives concentrations of silicon and aluminum identified by inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy are typical indicative of dust and dirt contamination icp detects where contaminant and additive elements present in the oil by ionizing the sample and using a mass spectrometer measures levels in the concentration this is all done in the laboratory this is not for you to mug up or to have it understood to the last detail even i don't understand this process of icp inductively coupled plasma 
it's a process used with light and the light reflection ultimately gives your answers but it is done in the laboratory and they are able to identify what is that particle that is there whether it is cast iron from the piston ring or is it cast iron from the cylinder liner or is it some particle from the bearing what it is they will be able to identify because by normal sight if you see the particles you can't make out anything okay what is the risk if abrasive contaminants are left unchecked extensive sometimes irreparable engine damage engine and component wear can occur reducing machine reliability and longevity and increasing maintenance repair and replacement costs so it is very crucial to have all abrasives in the oil removed so that is why i keep saying this lubricating oil is like the blood system of that engine if there is any defect in it it will destroy that engine microbial contamination i have already spoken to you about this and this is related to minute microorganisms in oil minute microorganism bacteria can exist in lubricating oil than fuel oil it is not only lube oil it can happen in fuel oil also under suitable conditions they can grow and multiply at phenomenal rates metal staining deposits and serious corrosion the presence of slime and smell of rotten eggs indicates a contaminated system that's true the smell is there but we have not faced it very often on the ship because most of the oil is continuously circulating chance of contamination exists only when the oil is stagnant water in the lubricating oil or fuel oil oxygen and appropriate temperature condition will result in the growth of bacteria and infestation of the system the removal of water or ensuring its presence is at the minimum is the best method of infestation prevention higher the temperature in settling device and drain tanks holding fuel or lubricating oil the better in other words to avoid microbial contamination you have to keep water out of it number 1 you have to avoid having stagnant oil tanks and number 3 you must keep the temperature as high as possible 60 70 even at 60 the bacteria can still exist but they don't get much of a chance to grow so it helps in reducing microbial contamination of your lubricating oil okay now i i think you have already done coolers in your auxiliary engines because the other sections told me so we have done coolers so this is your shell and shell and sorry shell and tube type and this is the explanation for the shell and tube type then you have the plate type of heat exchanger i had drawn some diagrams so anyway you don't you don't require this explanation because you are already aware of it so next this is the plate type of extinguisher that is there and you are also aware of this So next class we will start with cylinder lubrication. So this will be all for today, and we will continue in the next class. So we have thirty-six boys here in the class. Let me take the attendance, which actually means thirty-four, which actually means four candidates are absent. Now let us see which four. If you have any questions, you can ask. So what is the value of viscosity of lube oil? Nitinjay Kumar Rana. this is a probably is the 15th time i am telling you the value of the viscosity is mm, anything like no oh, sorry that was flash point not viscosity viscosity of the lubricating oil mm, i can't give you any figure right now because viscosity of the lube oil is anything same as your heavy oil or more so it should be about 250 centi stokes to 50 centi stokes i will not figure i will find out and let you know i don't really can give you any direct figure what is the viscosity because viscosity has to be measured at two different temperatures one is at 40 degree centigrade and what is that? oh ho oh, oh, ho oh. ho yes 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 it is given by sae sae 30 sae 40 sae 50 
120. Those are different grades of viscosities. For the main engine, crankcase oil, the viscosity is SAE40. All right. For the auxiliary engine, the SAE value may be 30 or 40. For the cylinder oil, the viscosity for the cylinder oil is SAE50. All right. What is SAE? Society of Automotive Engineers. They have graded the viscosities of the oil depending on what is their use. Your gear oils will have SAE 75, SAE 90, things like that. But for the main engine, SAE 40 is most common, some oil. For the cylinder oil, it is a little more viscous. It is SAE 50. Okay. Mrityanjay, does it answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. So let me take the attendance now. For a moment, you had me baffled because I was thinking in terms of flashpoint. Okay. Divakar, 78, 79, 80 is missing. 8080 0, 0 missing. Uh, 818283. Uh, Himansh Mukherjee, are you 8084? Yes, sir. 84, sir. Okay. 8586, 8, 7 is missing. 8087. 8087. 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, Nine four. Mm. Karutharan, you are nine five. Yes, sir. Nine five. Okay. Uh, nine six. Uh, Khalid Yaya, are you nine seven? Yes, he's nine yes, seven. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Nine eight nine nine one hundred. Hundred and two is missing. Eight one zero two. Eight one zero two. They may be withdrawn also. There are some withdrawn cadets. One two three four is missing. Eight one zero four. Eight one zero four. Four five six eight one zero seven Manish Kumar Yadav, you're eight one zero seven, right? Manish Kumar Yadav. So he's vanished. So we'll put him as absent. And yes. unless he's eight one zero seven. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, why are we quiet? Day. Yeah, you got a little bit of ignition delay. A, a long ignition delay. So you will have after burning. Mm, must respond immediately. Uh, Muhammad Azaruddin, you are 8109? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 is Mithunjay Kumar Rana. Ah, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. 15, 16, 17. Neha. All right. That will be all. I am spelling out the absentees and withdrawn. 8080, 8102 and 8104. Okay, that will be all for today. Stay safe. I yes, Divakar, go ahead. Sir, I have a question I have written in chat box, sir. Uh, what is the question? Me, sir. Yes. Siddhant, what sir, is it? 8104, sir. So my screen was froze, frozen. That's why I just started, sir. Joined again. Okay, okay. 8104, present. All right. Okay. Any question? Be ready for your class test next week. And sir, I have written in chat box. Huh. What is sir, it? I have sir, I have written in chat box, sir. Uh, you have written? Okay, let me see. Let me see. One minute. Why compressors are started and stopped in unloaded condition only? To stop overloading the motor. That is the main thing. And how is unloading done? Good question. You see, <clears throat> there are drains, the automatic drains. There are unloaders and loaders automatic. From the compression chamber, there is a separate passage on which there is a solenoid valve. All right. So when you start the compressor, the solenoid valve is active, which means the compressed space is open to atmosphere. So when the compression pressure, when the piston moves up, there is no compression. Why? Because the air inside is being discharged to the atmosphere. So once that continues for some time, 
that means the compressor is very free to rotate if there is no compression that means there is no load on top of the piston and that is achieved by keeping the space open to atmosphere by means of a solenoid valve this solenoid valve is operated through a timer timing valve timer so when you switch on this the timer also comes on for say 10 seconds or 15 seconds depending on what it is the solenoid valve remains open so after 10 seconds this timer will close that valve moment it closes that valve the air inside the compressor cannot be discharged to the atmosphere it becomes compressed to force itself and open the delivery valve and then go into the air bottle so the idea of having an unloader is to start the motor on minimum load or almost no load so that can happen if there is no work being done by the compressor that is the compressor is just discharging air into the atmosphere not against a pressure of 30 bar or 20 bar so once the motor picks up speed it gets its momentum then the loader come into uh, into action and then the load comes up on the motor so initially it is intended to start the motor on no load that is the idea and also stop in unloaded condition yes that is also true so if you suddenly unload a motor, there'll be a dip. There'll be a, a rather there'll be a fluctuation in the voltage in the uh, amperage in the generator. So initially they unload it again. The solenoid will come into action and open the atmosphere, and then after ten seconds it will close. That is the idea, so that the compressor is not overloaded at the time of start. If you now suppose what happens, suppose you start compressing without allowing that air in the compression chamber out into the atmosphere, what will happen? That full motor will be loaded with enormous load at the very start. So the current will shoot up like anything and possibly it will trip off. It is not intended for such high load. So you start the motor on no load by having no load on the compressor. And then again, when it is on high load, the generator is making enough power to ensure that the motor can run. And suddenly when you cut off the load, that generator will be still generating that amper, uh, current. So the whole current will shoot up, voltage may shoot up. So to maintain some stability in the bus bars, you have to unload the motor first before switching off. 8104 present, sir. I have already marked you present. Why so worried? Screen stopped working. That is why I have to join again. And it took time due to bad network. Microphone was not good due to network issues. Okay. Bye-bye, boys. Take care of your health. Be ready for next week's class test. It will be the same way we have done it in the previous time. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.